its uh, flaming aspect was actually the aspect of its central heart. So there was a body in the sky that grew bright and grew dim. And that body is identifiable as a primeval sun named in astronomical traditions as the planet Saturn. So we go to the astronomical traditions and we look for some indication uh, of traditions pointing to something that would make no sense under our sky today. Well, we don't have to look far because the astronomical texts say, Shamash, always identified conventionally as the sun. They say, Shamash is the planet Saturn. So you can't get any more explicit than that in terms of this extraordinary and utterly preposterous series of identifications that you would go to look for once you had this passion to trace down the authenticity of the, this reconstruction. I, I would have to say, recognizing that this can sound incredibly dogmatic. Uh, I, I mean, you just, I, I, can't, I can't free myself from the seemingly dogmatic aspect. I just have to identify things you would expect to find that other people tell me what they would expect to find if this occurred, and then I can help them uh, identify the confirmation in the ancient record while also confirming that there's nothing in our experience today that would lo logically cause you to expect any of these things. So, Shamash is the planet Saturn. That's the, the declaration of the ancient Babylonian astronomical text. It's been recognized for 150 years. They puzzled over it and then they just went past it and say, okay, that's an oddity. But then uh, uh, along come other scholars like this brilliant expert, Franz Boll. He discovered that Helios, the sun god, was anciently identified as Kronos. Well, that's the Greek name of Saturn. So there's a convergence of traditions on these absurdities that is, uh, is going to convince you that it can't all be absurd. There has to be some explanation for this. And then along comes another scholar who says, oh, guess this, guess what? The alchemists, the preservers of ancient wisdom, they said Saturn is the best sun. It's the prototype of the sun, effectively. That's what that means. And there you can follow these traditions and with different language, different nuances and so on, but all the way over into uh, China, this sun that is being uh, presented in the ancient sources doesn't have any features in common with our sun because it occupied the celestial pole. It was the center of the sky, the center of the visual revolutions of the heavens. So what did the Chinese astronomers say about Saturn? Uh, Saturn primordially occupied the celestial pole. That's what they say. What did the Greeks say about Saturn? Kronos, it was the summit of the polar axis. And this is what is meant by occupying the summit of Mount Olympus. Mount, Mount Olympus was Aegeus, the axis. So there's an integrity that is inconceivable if, if you just project backwards our sky today and try to figure out what people were looking at in, in, in the past, you'll not find a single explanation of anything. No, I think it, it probably was intimately involved, but not in an, ex, in an exclusive sense. Uh, Saturn was the overarching ruler of the sky, and there, it, it, I think it's pretty uh, likely that the electrified domain of Saturn was uh, a plasma envelope in which all, all of the planets were present and there were characteristics of this plasma domain. I mean, just for example, there were no stars seen. So something was going on within an envelope uh, uh, of ancient planetary gathering, a, a gathering of planets that precluded humans from 
seeing or talking about anything outside that envelope. I can't find evidence of our sun in the sky in these earlier times. I can't find evidence of the moon. People will think they're seeing evidence of the moon and the star and crescent and so on. That's a completely different uh, issue because that star and crescent has a literal explanation, whereas the star and crescent is actually meaningless until you you find yourself at this explanation. The primeval form in the sky involved a central discharging star in the center of the great sphere of Saturn. As we entered a, a more diffuse environment and the light of our sun began to break through this envelope, it cast a, a uh, crescent on Saturn as seen from Earth, and it wasn't going through phases. It was revolving around the central star in a cycle of day and night. So the coming of day and night becomes a key theme in this story of the ancient creation uh, uh, of the gods, a central star. In the, in the center of that star, the discharging Venus, was a, a smaller, darker sphere identified as Mars. The background sphere of Saturn coming to be illuminated by the sun as the environment was clearing. And because it was at the celestial pole, that crescent revolved in a cycle of growing bright, growing dim, growing bright. And that's what became the mythic symbolism for the the cycle of day and night in later times. It's just that the symbols being used, star and crescent, crescent below, crescent above, and so on, crescent below the phase of brightness, crescent above the phase of dimming, because we were coming into a, a more active role of our sun in the cycle of day and night. But this was still that planetary configuration up there, so I, I found myself uh, looking into the cycle of day and night and looking to see if there was anything to challenge this idea that a central star with a crescent revolving around it was the defining cycle of day and night. And there's, there's nothing that I can find or name that is inconsistent with that idea of growing bright, growing dim, it's not sunrise and sunset, that's the, trans the translator trying to make sense of these images of the, this central star. And, well, that, that crescent form, because of its relationship to this configuration as a whole, it has a vast story to present to us. Because there's this pillar of the sky, and the pillar of the sky lines up with the central star and this crescent, and suddenly you have the heaven-raising warrior hero figure. That's the Mars figure par excellence. The entire planetary configuration was so different and it was sustained, I would presume, by largely electrical forces, not, not by gravity. It was a different system. And at, at the breakup of that system is the, the story of the departure of the gods. I mean, and in, in fact, what culture didn't remember? We were once living in the presence of the gods, they went away. Well, what happened to hold them in place? We're not, we can only surmise certain things, but an unraveling of that configuration would logically lead to all the stories of catastrophe and so on, because planets aren't going to just sail off and never to be seen. They were part of a coherent system, and gravity isn't going to just let them go wherever they want. So, that it was apparently a somewhat contained environment progressively unraveling un uh, into enough freedom for the planets to find their equilibrium positions in the system we know today. These would be largely gravitational equilibrium positions Well, it depends whether a person is uh, being provoked by an extraordinary possibility that he finds interesting enough to want to know. So we start with this idea. Uh, is this interesting to you? Is, 
is there something you'd like to explore here? And we're developing tools for those who want to know uh, and want to bring their own reason, make their own judgment on this. This is all about evidence. We don't try to convince anyone of anything in the abstract. It's just we clarify a story where the story has such amazing detail that you can explore this for yourself. I mean, okay, there's a great warrior. He, he is always identified with his uh, weapon. Well, why, why would that be? Well, we identify a configuration in the sky associated with the planet Mars and his weapon becomes the, the, his weapon is the cosmic thunderbolt. Here are the forms. Well, go look and see if you can find anything in the human record that, that suggests something else than that. The effect on humanity? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that is a uh, absolutely essential part of this. Uh, you, eventually you come to a, a point where there is um, a human interpretation coming in and human interpretations are carried right into the birth of the great religions and philosophical systems and so on. So it, everything goes back to the beginning philosophy and religion and political thought and political institutions, rights of kingship, sacred marriage rights, all of this, the, the, the ideal warrior, the ideal female form, all of these things uh, are uh, traceable back to a unified beginning and in the, the activity of this gathering of bodies in the sky, you can always link up the primal primary themes of the early cultures. There are no themes of the early cultures that can't be traced back to this fundamental idea, but what about when it begins to unravel and things grow more chaotic and humanity is being traumatized? So the traumas affecting humanity never disappeared. <laughs>